Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, July GDJC uh, talk. Uh, this time we have uh, Neftali Eduardo Antonio Villa from uh, the National University, Autonomous University from Mexico. And he's going to present on social demographic inequalities in diabetes of groups at Mexico and USA, a data-driven individual and epidemiological perspective. Uh, thanks, Neftali, for accepting the invitation. And the floor is uh, yours. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I can uh, see that I am sharing my screen now. Uh, can you confirm? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a truly pleasure and honor to be here with you folks. Uh, first, I want to thank Omar uh, for inviting me for this Global Diabetes Journal Club Talks um, to present the results of diverse lines of research uh, related to sociodemographic inequalities in diabetes in Mexico. Uh, I want to introduce myself. Um, as Omar uh, mentioned it, uh, I am a, a physician by uh, uh, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, but I also studied a specialist degree in applied statistics, and I am currently finishing my PhD degree uh, all at the UNAM. Um, I am also a research assistant at the National Institute of Cardiology, and my primary line of research is focused on studying the sociodemographic determinants on uh, health outcomes, uh, particularly on uh, cardiometabolic diseases in Mexico and Latin America. So let's begin our slides. Uh, here is my conflict of interest form. I have nothing to declare. Um, let me, uh, oh, sorry. Let me point the pointer here to, uh, yeah. Uh, I want to share the agenda for today. Uh, uh, I want to briefly recap the epidemiological situation of diabetes in Mexico and why this disease has complex scenario for performing uh, epidemiological research. Then I want to uh, talk about the incredible team and efforts of the RINASET team that made a tremendous effort for elucidating the uh, epidemiology of type 1 diabetes in Mexico. Uh, finally, I want to share the novel approaches that we are trying to make to elucidate the complexity of type 2 diabetes using a data-driven approach uh, of clustering analysis in the United States and Mexico. Um, well, uh, briefly, uh, as we all know, diabetes is a healthcare problem worldwide. Uh, Mexico is not the exception as it has been classified as the fifth country with the highest prevalence in diabetes according to the IDF statistics. And in consequently, diabetes has been one of the main causes of mortality uh, across the last two decades. As you can see, both uh, diagrams show that the Mexico has one of the highest uh, tolls of prevalence and mortality of diabetes in Latin America. We are the second place in Latin American country with the highest prevalence of diabetes only just below uh, Brazil. Now we want to ask to ourselves, how we are we measuring diabetes from an epidemiological point of view? In a nutshell, we usually classify diabetes uh, within these two subgroups, type one diabetes and type two diabetes. And in the midway, uh, we have these patients classified as LADA and other entities that are classified uh, as having diabetes, but are not necessarily uh, driven by this big classification. We have the MODI classes, uh, secondary class, and diabetes during pregnancy. Um, but in an epidemiological way, we usually estimate the prevalence and mortality as a proxy to estimate the burden of the disease. But this has a problem. The main problem is that this does not necessarily capture the heterogeneity of diabetes. I mean, we don't capture the complexity related to clinical outcomes and clinical management. So we usually, uh, as we don't have a complete capturing of the heterogeneity, we have difficult to set individual and personalized management in our population. We usually translate other evidence to our country and we uh, assume that this evidence is applicable to our population. So this, this is particularly a, a of attention because we don't know whatever the evidence and the epidemiology is, uh, uh, is unknown within a vulnerable population. And this may experience a higher burden of the disease. Then uh, I want to focus your attention to the attempts that we have made in Mexico to elucidate a bit better approach of studying diabetes in our country. So I want to start with type one diabetes. 
Uh, as many of you know, uh, type 1 diabetes is the most prevalent chronic endocrine disease in uh, pediatrics. Nevertheless, in adults, it is quite difficult to make a follow-up uh, study because uh, usually there are no registries that captures uh, adults living with this disease. So for this effort, I want to present the Renaset DT1, uh, which uh, is a tremendous effort by Dr. Raquel Faraji Hassan. She and her team created this registry with the objective to be an open online platform endorsed by the Mexican Society of Nutrition and Endocrinology with the attempt to make a follow-up of patients, adult patients living with T1D in and capturing clinical and management variables. You can access to this um, website of the Renaset where you can access the original protocol here presented and published and uh, all the published uh, manuscript uh, of this registry. As you can see, as up to December of the last year, uh, the Renaset had registered up to uh, 1,600 patients, mostly living in the uh, principal cities in Mexico. Uh, as you can see in this map, most of these patients live in Jalisco and Mexico City and the Mexico State. Um, the Mexico uh, metropolitan area is here, so it is uh, um, rational that we think that many of these patients have lived within the main cities. Now, when Dr. Raquel invited me to collaborate with her uh, team, I talked her with uh, the implications about the social uh, determinants of health. And most importantly, whether these social determinants impacted the management of the disease. In Mexico and in many other parts of Latin America, most people can access to healthcare services. And when we talk about type 1 diabetes, this is a problem because type 1 diabetes requires long-term and continuous treatment, which usually involves um, an expense for the patient and also an expense for the healthcare system. And this creates a gap in the treatment of these uh, patients. So uh, in uh, summary, patients mostly are treated within public sectors, which is the main time of scheme for uh, which many of the Mexicans have access to. And in a lesser proportion, people access to private healthcare services, which tend to be um, a little bit better, but the difference relies on the income and the expenditure of health that this patient could um, have for, the, for their treatment. So we performed this study to elucidate the difference in metabolic and related type 1 diabetes complication among patients treated in public and private healthcare services registered in this uh, Renaset T1D uh, uh, data set. And an interesting secondary analysis, we wanted to evaluate whether diabetes education acted as a mediator in the probability of achieving therapeutic goals. So let me present you uh, a brief uh, method, uh, what we did done in this manuscript. Uh, we included only patients living with T1D classified it uh, according by the American Diabetes Association and confirmed by an endo endocrinologist uh, specialist. And for this analysis, we included only patients that require insulin at the moment of diagnosis. Uh, the parameters included for uh, the complete analysis that you can access uh, for the whole manuscript are the sociodemographic, clinical, biochemical variables, treatment related variables, education and complications divided as acute and chronic. Um, we will see this in the next slides. Um, and the type of healthcare was classified according to the expenditure or the main source of funding uh, given by the government. If the main source was given by the government, uh, then it was classified as public. And if uh, the patient uh, paid for most of the uh, healthcare services, it was classified as private healthcare services. So I want to share the main results. There are a lot of results in the uh, manuscript. But I want to share the main uh, outcomes of this manuscript. And you can see uh, there is a significant difference in glycated hemoglobin in patients treated with public healthcare sector, and this is reproduced in fasting plasmatic glucose. You can see that patients treated in the public healthcare sectors trend to have at least 1% increase in glycated hemoglobin compared with patients treated in the private healthcare sectors. Um, we use a mixed effect logistic regression model to explore whatever the public healthcare sector confer a decreased probability or a decreased odds to achieve uh, therapeutic goals. We observe that only the public healthcare sectors confer uh, or 
well, patients treated in the public healthcare sectors had decreased odds of achieving glycemic goals defined by an H1C lesser than 7.8% and a systolic blood pressure lesser than 1,040%. Um, this was adjusted for these uh, sociodemographic and clinical variables. Now, we were able to assess full above estimation using the time from the type 1 diabetes diagnosis and the last date of clinical visit, and we uh, estimate a, a survival analysis to explore whether there was an increased risk for complications. We decided to evaluate acute complication as a, a moderate to severe hypoglycemia events, diabetic ceto ketoacidosis, and hospitalization for any cause. We observed that the public healthcare sectors do not confer an increased risk for any of these evaluated outcomes after adjusted for these uh, covariates. But there is an interesting finding that we observed that patients treated in the public sector had increased risk for developing diabetic chronic disease, diabetic retinopathy, and diabetic neuropathy. This risk was sustained after uh, adjusting for covariates and was um, uh, substantially the same across the time of study, which one can suggest that there is an associated risk related to only chronic, chronic, chronic complications for uh, type 1 diabetes. Finally, we assess the mediation effect of type 1 diabetes knowledge as the sum of uh, many variables related to diabetes education, whether the patient knows to count carbohydrates or whether the patient knows how to adjust insulin uh, and many other education-related variables. And we wanted to evaluate whether these influence the relationship between the type of healthcare setting and the glycemic control between uh, subjects. We observe that diabetes education is responsible of almost 30% of the probability of achieving glycemic control related to the healthcare service. So in conclusion, we uh, uh, derive from this work that there is an increased risk for uh, developing a, a metabolic off goals and chronic complication associated with the type of public care. We also observe that diabetes education is an important mediator related to the a glycemic control and a, the type of healthcare setting, which could be interpreted as an intervention target towards promoting strategies to increase diabetes education between both settings. All these results reveal that there is a health inequality and a health gap between both types of settings of healthcare. So people living with type 1 diabetes in Mexico experience these health inequalities across uh, this study period, but this revealed that the gap inherited to the system uh, affects directly in the management of uh, these patients. So this is one, this was the first attempt to elucidate uh, the uh, epidemiology of type 1 diabetes in Mexico. And we at, are still missing one of the uh, main um, pieces of diabetes, which is type 2 diabetes. Now, I want to recap this beautiful picture made by uh, Professor Emma Alkovich. Uh, she and her team had the idea that patients living with type 2 diabetes uh, tend to have heterogeneous outcomes, and hence uh, we can study diabetes as an heterogeneous entity. But she had the idea that we can cluster this entity into diverse subgroups named clusters with use with uh, clinical and simple variables. She proposed the use of BMI, uh, A1C, uh, HOMA indexes, and GABA antibodies to cluster these four, uh, these five, uh, sorry, uh, clusters to better characterize this disease. Her team in Lund Institute derived this idea into many other uh, research, and this then was applied to other uh, implications such as genetic, physiological research, and clinical trial interventions. But an important question remains, what about the epidemiological approaches? How can we study diabetes using this approach in an epidemiological way? Well, as you know, um, uh, the, when we evaluated a cohort or, or a subset of uh, a lot of patients, we tend to classify them in groups. In this case, we tend to classify it in subgroups, which have proven to have a clinical implication and a precision a targeted interventions. But the real question relies whether these groups are equally distributed among different populations, particularly in uh, 
minorities underrepresented in diverse studies. Although uh, diverse groups have tried to explore the role of diabetes subgroups across different studies, in Latin America, there are only two previously published studies that have sought to explore this uh, concept in our population. And one of the main findings that we have found in our group of study is that this uh, proportion uh, uh, that have been reported uh, mainly in Caucasian population does not, um, does, does not uh, fulfill um, uh, in Mexico. So uh, we know that the age-related and the obesity-related uh, are one of the highest prevalent subgroups and in a less proportion, the insulin deficient and the insulin resistant subgroups, which tend to be the most uh, dangerous or the most uh, hazardous uh, subgroups as these groups tend to develop the most uh, chronic complication related to diabetes. In Mexico, we don't know whether this is gonna be true, but we have found that one of the main limitations regarding studying diabetes, as I mentioned in the beginning of the slide, is that it typically requires C-peptide measurement. So this is one of the main limitations of applying this concept to uh, minorities, because not all the cohorts in Mexico and probably in many other parts of Latin America measure C-peptide as a, a routinely measurement. Also, another limitation is the use of HOMA indexes. HOMA uses insulin as their estimation, and these tend to have a high variability among the same su subject. So it is quite difficult to estimate insulin resistance using this HOMA approach. Furthermore, most of the physiopathology behind these subgroups are derived from studies performed in China, United States, and Europe. So the first of them was made by uh, Dr. Omar Bello Chaboya, my uh, mentor, um, he and her team, uh, here his team, sorry, uh, develop a clinical prediction model based on a machine learning approach to identify these four diabetes subgroups. You can access the whole manuscript uh, using this QR code. And uh, let me uh, uh, summarize the main findings. Uh, our team trained a cell normalized neural network algorithm using the National uh, Health and Nutrition Service from the cycles of 1999 to 2004. And then we derive four models using four using different clinical surveys. The first model uses the same variables uh, proposed by Emma Alkovich and her team. Uh, we included here the C-peptide measurement. We then derive a second model that uses insulin, but using only the HOMA IR and the HOMA beta uh, approach. And then a third model that doesn't require uh, um, glycated hemoglobin the estimation. We only use uh, fasting glucose as an estimate for measuring uh, A1C. And finally, a model that does not require insulin for its estimation. As a proxy, we use a previously validated index for measuring insulin resistance and visceral adipose tissue named METS-IR and METS-BF. These indexes do, does not uh, measure, uh, does not require insulin for measuring insulin resistance and adipose tissue. Using these four algorithms, we display an excellent accuracy among um, identifying the four subgroups here displayed, the insulin resistant, insulin deficient, age-related, and obesity-related phenotype. We display an excellent accuracy across the four models, being the model one, uh, an accuracy almost of 100. Using these four algorithms, we then decided to develop a clinical application for the individualized treatment and also for epidemiological use. You can access this application using this QR code. Uh, we then apply this uh, application and this algorithm used in different Mexican cohorts for studying the prevalence of diabetes in 2016. We use this code also to explore the phenotypes and its association with genetic uh, phenotypes, particularly this uh, aplotype, which has uh, demonstrated to increase the risk of diabetes in Mexico. We also identify factors for the incidence of diabetes subgroups using the, the metabolic syndrome cohort, a Mexican cohort that evaluated uh, diabetes incidence. And finally, we use uh, the CAIPADI cohort to evaluate the clinical trajectories uh, among diabetes subgroups related to clinical treatment. So now with that we have this tool and a way to reproduce the clusters in a fashion way, we decide to make this manuscript. This, one of, this is one of the first approaches to use the cluster approach 
to characterize the epidemiology first using data from the United States. We use almost three decades of information to evaluate the epidemiological impact of these uh, diabetes subgroups, but most impo importantly, factors or sociodemographic factors related to the epidemiological trends. We also assess the population aging and obesity as factors that modify the diabetes uh, subgroup prevalence. Briefly, um, you can uh, read the complete methodolog methodology in this uh, link, but we use data from approximately 5,500 uh, 5, individuals to assess uh, the model wall of our algorithm in uh, only adults living with T2D. Um, we use these measurements to estimate our model one uh, approach and then we estimate the weighted prevalence, uh, which uh, then can be interpreted as the national representative prevalence, and we estimate the changes across cycles. Then we stratify this prevalence according to sex, race, and educational profile. Here is the main uh, figure of the uh, manuscript. We observed in our results that diabetes has increased consistently over time across the United States, but this has been mainly attributable to two subgroups, the obesity-related phenotype and the age-related subgroup. So we can uh, uh, conclude with this figure that these two subgroups have increased or have uh, raised the prevalence among these three decades in the United States. Then when we stratify these subgroups in its individual uh, uh, prevalence, we observe that almost 6.5% and 3.9% of all the population living in the United States were classified as the obesity-related and the age-related phenotype. And in a lesser proportion, we observed that the insulin deficient and the insulin resistant phenotypes were uh, prevalent in uh, the population in the United States. But we observed that these subgroups does not increase um, in a significant way across these three decades of study. When we certify across ethnicity, we observe that uh, all uh, ethnic groups had the obesity related phenotype as the highest one, but we observe that non-Hispanic black and the Mexican American subgroups had an increase in the insulin deficient phenotype. This could be interpreted that the ethnicity directly impact the presentation of a specific diabetes subgroup. Then when we stratify by educational attainments, as expected, we observed that subjects in primary or no education had the highest prevalence of diabetes compared with subjects with college or higher education. But an interesting finding related to the diabetes subgroups is that subjects with lower educational attainments tend to have an increased prevalence of the age-related and the insulin deficient uh, phenotype, which repeat, I, uh, as I mentioned, this phenotype is associated with the highest complications of related uh, diabetes. This, this uh, study uh, then uh, changed uh, a little bit the paradigm that we have that diabetes is only dependent on individual clinical management. So we wanted to make a next step. We wanted to make this concept apl applicable to Mexican population. So as a second approach, we wanted to evaluate the diabetes trends and particularly the diabetes subgroups in relationship with social disparities in Mexico across the years 2006 to 2018. We use a similar approach. Um, we use uh, our cluster algorithm to uh, classify subjects across these national representative surveys. We only have data available to make cluster for these years. Uh, this is a main limitation of this manuscript, but we can observe a trend uh, of across 15 years. We then extracted uh, data from approximately 10,000 individuals uh, from biochemical and anthropometric markers, history of diabetes, medication and complication, and most importantly, self-reported access to health services. Finally, to evaluate in a uh, structural way the social lag, we use the social lag index extracted from the Coneval across these years. Uh, the social lag index is an uh, uh, index that summarizes many other uh, compounds like access to water, access to uh, healthcare services, uh, access to uh, 
uh, living, uh, um, etc. So it summarizes uh, many of the components of social lag into one simple index to evaluate the social lag in a fashion way. So, um, and the analytic approach behind this study is similar to, to for what we have presented in previous works. We stratified the prevalence in the four regions of our country, but also across the 32 states of Mexico. We also classify, uh, we also estimate the prevalence across uh, states classified as high and low uh, social lag uh, categories. Then we, the, we, the, we rest, sorry, we uh, extracted the prevalence between uh, each cycle to estimate a change across time. And we estimate the net change as the difference between 2012 and 2006. This was our big marker of how we can we increase our prevalence across these 15 years. Then to confirm if there is an uh, association between uh, social uh, marginalization and these diabetes subgroups, we use a, so, a Morgan partial correlation coefficient to evaluate whatever the uh, states with higher social lag trying to have an increase in one specific subgroup. Finally, as a sensitivity analysis, we make a random effect logistic regression model to evaluate whether um, the social lag confer an increased probability of develop an specific diabetes subgroup. Uh, here are the preliminary results. We hope to publish these final results uh, by the end of this month. Um, as you can see, diabetes has consistently increased over uh, the uh, study period in Mexico. We estimated a prevalence in 2020 of approximately 15.6%, which give, gave us a net change of 6.6% compared to 2006 period. Regarding the prevalence of diabetes subgroups, we can see that in the red right figure that the most prevalent uh, phenotype was the insulin deficient phenotype here in blue. As you can see, this breaks the paradigm uh, that has been established by other uh, studies that the uh, obesity related phenotype is the most frequent presentation. Here we observe that the insulin deficient followed by the obesity related are the most frequent presentation of this phenotype in Mexico followed by the age-related and the insulin-resistant phenotype. Now, an important question remains. Is the change in prevalence of diabetes and its subgroups have been the same on all the regions or are particularly uh, clustered in some regions of Mexico? We made these maps uh, to divide by the four main regions of Mexico, the northern, the central, the metropolitan area, and the south region, which is characterized to be the poorest region in our country. And we observed that when we evaluate the net change of prevalence, the south region, which I repeat is the poorest region in our country, uh, trend to have the highest increase in prevalence compared to 2006. So here we can see that diabetes had changed uh, disproportionately across the regions in Mexico. And this may be attributable to sociodemographic factors. And what about our diabetes subgroups? Here we can see the age-related phenotype. Here we observe that the age-related phenotype had a slightly increase all across Mexico, but most importantly in the northern regions of uh, our country. Um, this uh, finding could be interpreted as the northern region shares similarities with the southern states of the United States. So as we um, mentioned in the previous uh, slide, uh, the age-related phenotype uh, is, has been one of the main phenotypes that have changed in, Me in the United States. It is reasonable, reasonable to think that this phenotype has also a change or real link to the northern region of our country. And this was confirmed by the obesity-related phenotype. Uh, you can observe in these slides that the obesity-related phenotype increased uh, primarily in the northern region, uh, supporting the hypothesis that the northern states compare uh, mostly with the United States regions in the south. So we concluded that the obesity-related has increased primarily within the northern region of our country. But this is an important slide and one of the most important results of our study. Uh, we observed that the insulin deficient phenotype has sharply increased only in the southern region of our country. And you remember that diabetes has increased its prevalence mainly in the south region. So we can think 
that diabetes had exponentially increased, mainly driven by this phenotype. So the sad region was characterized to be the one that had the increased trends of this phenotype of risk. Finally, uh, the insulin resistance subgroup, we do not observe a, a significant increase, but we do observe it in the central region and the metropolitan area of Mexico. So this makes us wonder if there is an spatial association with the prevalence of certain diabetes subgroups and the social lag. So we perform a chloroplet map to visualize the relationship uh, between the social lag index and the net change of prevalence. You can observe in the darkest colors that um, in those states that have the darkest colors trend to have the highest increase, but trend to have an increase or decrease uh, social lag. As you can see, the northern region in, the, in Mexico trend to have the highest increase in prevalence of the age-related as well as the obesity-related phenotypes. This um, could be interpreted as these regions shared similarities with uh, the United States. But most importantly, the insulin-deficient uh, phenotype is related and linked to the southern regions of our country, which is the regions to have the highest social lag. So this pattern may be also applicable to other central and south uh, regions of Latin America. So these preliminary studies breaks the paradigm that the obesity related and the age related are the most frequent presentation. This phenotype, as you uh, remember, is the most is the highest risk phenotype for type uh, two diabetes related complications. And for the insulin resistant, we observe a, a relative clear pattern within the central regions of Mexico. Finally, to support this hypothesis, we decide to make a partial um, uh, morgal spatial correlation coefficient. Uh, we only observe a significant association between the insulin deficient subgroup and the social lag only in the last two years, in the 2018 and the 2020 cycles, which could be interpreted as this phenotype has increased dramatically only in the south regions in the last years. So, to confirm this hypothesis, we decided to make these uh, mixed effect logistic regression models. And we observed that increases in social lag index or increase in social marginalization increased the prevalence only in the insulin deficient phenotype for the years 2016, 2018, and 2020. An important finding is that decreased social lag trend to be a uh, a protective factor for the age-related phenotypes, which make us interpret that higher uh, urbanization and higher uh, and lower social lag uh, predispose to an increase in the age-related phenotype. So we concluded that living in states with high social lag confer a higher odd to having this insulin deficient phenotype. Overall, we can conclude from all this slide on all this presentation that using diabetes subgroups reveal a powerful approach to better study the impact of sociodemographic determinants of diabetes using national representative service in the United States and Mexico. Compared to for what it had been published in previous studies, in Mexico, we are demonstrating that the insulin deficient subgroup is a phenotype of risk, and in particular in the southern regions of our country. And there is a consistent relationship between a higher social lag, which can then be interpreted as higher inequalities, and the prevalence of insulin deficient phenotype, which suggests that the socio-demographic environment uh, impacts directly in the presentation of diabetes in a country. And since this group, uh, these subgroups trend to vary over time, so the clinical useful, usefulness is uh, needed to be um, uh, further required in future studies. I want to thank all my friends uh, listed here in this slide, uh, particularly Omar for inviting me to this uh, presentation. I want to say that this is the effort of many people in last, enlisted here in this slide uh, that have been supporting me during, during my PhD formation. I want to thank the National uh, Autonomous University of Mexico and, uh, and the Facultad of Medicina and uh, this, uh, my two institutions of working. So let me know uh, if there is any comments and question in the forum and, and I'll let you uh, uh, my email and my Twitter for any further contact. Muchas gracias por su atención.